Let's find out about despotism. This man makes it his job to study these things. Well, for one thing, avoid the comfortable idea that the mere form of government can of itself safeguard a nation against despotism. When a competent observer looks for signs of despotism in a community, he looks beyond fine words and noble phrases. One nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This is a collaboration with Cypher, the cynical historian. To watch his piece on historical threats to American democracy, click the card at the end of this video. Section 2, Article 37 of the Weimar Constitution stipulated that without the approval of the German parliament, no member of that parliament could be detained or arrested. This wasn't to absolve politicians of crimes, no, they would be tried after the legislative session ended. But if no member of parliament could be detained, no member could be removed for political reasons to prevent them from voting. It was a check against tyranny. No member of the Reichstag would be limited in their personal liberty which might harm the member's ability to fulfill his mandate. In other words, to deprive the people of their duly elected representative, even if that representative was accused of a crime, was to violate the constitution of the Weimar Republic. And yet, on March 23rd, 1933, Several members of the German Reichstag, Parliament, were simply gone. I say several, it was over 100. Over 100 members missing for the most important vote of their career. The legislation was profound, affecting budgeting, military, foreign affairs, even altering what could be considered against the Constitution. The Reichstag was loud that day. Not only were members of the largest party particularly rowdy, yelling for the immediate passage of the legislation, but their supporters were also ravenous and eager, standing both outside and inside the chamber, patrolling the doorways with German shepherds, ready should anyone make the wrong decision. The leader of the opposition rose to speak against the measures, the first sentence somewhat forced as if to exhale his nerves, but the rest delivered deliberate and calm. We greet the persecuted and the oppressed. We greet our friends in the Reich. Your steadfastness and loyalty deserve admiration. The courage of your convictions and your unbroken optimism guarantee a brighter future. And so it ended. Germany's Weimar Constitution was adopted in 1919 after World War I. Section 2, Article 114 guaranteed deprivation of liberty only based on law. 115 established the privacy in one's own home. 117 privacy and correspondence. 118 freedom of speech in the press. 123, 124 freedom of assembly and association. 153 guarantee of property. 114, 115, 117, 118, 123, 124, 153. For 14 years, the Weimar Republic tried to assure these rights to its citizens. The dismantling of those rights took only hours. Just after nightfall on February 27, 1933, Nazi propagandist Joseph Goebbels was with the newly appointed Chancellor Adolf Hitler. He wrote in his diary, In the evening I sit at home and work. At nine, the fear comes for dinner. We play music and have conversation. Suddenly a call from Dr. Humpfstengel. The Reichstag is on fire. I believed it to be a flight of fancy and refused to tell the fear. But it was no hallucination. The Reichstag, the meeting place of the German parliament, was burning. The dome standing above the words, to the German people, was hollowed. The story in court went that at nine, the same time Hitler arrived for his dinner with Goebbels, a Dutch communist, Marnus van der Lubbe, entered the Reichstag building and went about setting fires before being apprehended. After realizing the claims of fire in the Reichstag weren't fantasy, Goebbels claims that he and Hitler raced there at 100 kilometers, 60 miles an hour. There, before the burning building, 
outrages were exchanged. The officials were certain of a larger communist plot. Bolsheviks were replicating their Russian successes in Berlin. Hitler is said to have exclaimed, This is a signal from God. If this fire, as I believe, is the work of the communists, then we must crush out this murderous pest with an iron fist. In terms of communists, subsequent trial and historical documentation seem to prove that van der Lubbe acted alone. The question of whether in setting the fire van der Lubbe was followed and unwittingly aided by Nazis looking to take advantage of the situation is still a matter of historical debate. What no one questions is that the fire was exactly what Hitler needed to consolidate power before an election. Within hours, his cabinet sent off what came to be known as the Reichstag Fire Decree. It began with this. On the basis of Article 48, Paragraph 2 of the Constitution of the German Reich, the following is ordered in defense against communist state endangering acts of violence. Articles 114, 115, 117, 118, 123, 124, and 153 of the Constitution of the German Reich are suspended until further notice. Already in the streets of Berlin, Hitler's essay, the Sturmabteilung in their brown shirts were breaking down the doors of left-leaning newspapers. 4,000 members of left political opposition were arrested and carted away for torture. William L. Shirer, journalist and author of the book The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, was present in Germany during the fire and fallout in 1933, and he writes what I think is pretty concise and poignant. With all the resources of the national and Prussian governments at their disposal, the Nazis carried on an election propaganda such as Germany had never seen before. For the first time, the state-run radio carried the voices of Hitler, Goering, and Goebbels to every corner of the land. The streets, bedecked with swastika flags, echoed to the tramp of the stormtroopers. There were mass rallies, torchlight parades, the din of loudspeakers in the squares. The billboards were plastered with flamboyant Nazi posters, and at night, bonfires lit up the hills. The electorate was in turn conjoled with the promises of a German paradise. Intimidated by the brown terror in the streets, and frightened by revelations about the communist revolution. At this point, you and I are left with profound questions, ones that I, being perfectly honest, don't feel comfortable answering with authority. What factors led to the fall of the German Republic, and was it inevitable? What role did economics, institutions, and individual leaders play in this? There's mythology here, too. There's a Hitler-centric interpretation of history that only Hitler and his dynamism could lead to the Third Reich. There's a German-centric interpretation, one often espoused by the Nazis themselves, that German history was pointing towards a savior, a Fuhrer, to lead them. There were communists that saw the Third Reich as a step towards capitalism's collapse. My goal in writing this video, and the goal of Cypher the Cynical Historian in writing his piece for this collaboration, was not to provide absolute answers, but rather to facilitate a larger and more mature conversation about authoritarianism. So let's go deeper with this topic. By the time World War I ended in November 1918, roughly one-fifth of Germany's population had served. As millions of malnourished men demobilized from the front lines, they displaced female workers who had taken up jobs in wartime factories. Rationing and food shortages were the norm. Fuel was short. Veterans were isolated. Many would carry physical and psychological ailments for the rest of their days. But their government was preoccupied with achieving better terms of surrender by appearing more democratic and impressing the Allied powers. Eric de Weitz posits in his book about the Weimar Republic that the pressure on the Kaiser to abdicate at the end of the war, that the push by generals for Germany's democratization after World War I, it was all a cynical exploit, an attempt to impress the Allied powers, and ultimately to move blame for the war defeat onto an elected body. If civilian government negotiated peace, the military could obfuscate incompetency onto them. Indeed, many Germans came to believe that the military hadn't lost the war, but rather the civilian government had stabbed the German army in the back. And of course, this myth often came seasoned with anti-Semitism. Germany skidded into a Republican system of government. In a hurry and without authorization, a social democrat named Philipp Scheidemann interrupted lunch in November 1918, stepped out onto a balcony of the Reichstag overlooking a crowd, and declared the German Republic. Just down the road, the future founder of the German Communist Party made a rival declaration of a free socialist republic in the Soviet model. In his book, The Weimar Republic, Detlef Poikert asserts that the chaos, the suffering of the populace, the rival declarations of the republic, it all foreshadows a lack of legitimacy. He says, it suggests a lack of active commitment to the new order. 
Despite democratization, the terms of the Treaty of Versailles were oppressive. When the victorious Allied powers convened in France to determine a post-World War I order, Germany's fate was prescribed. 15% of its territory forfeit, its military disarmed, and the reparations to be paid abstractly large. Lastly, Germany would assume all guilt for the Great War. 100% of the carnage, 100% of the inhumanity, Germany's. The humiliation of taking full responsibility for the entire war, along with the widespread suspicion among the public that Germany's parliamentary leadership had forced the Kaiser and his generals to surrender, left the German Republic, with its progressive constitution, damaged before the ink had dried. wurde Deutschland gezwungen, den Schandvertrag von Versailles zu unterzeichnen. There was immediate division. The Social Democratic Party won the most votes in the 1920 elections, but it was only about 22%, so they had to form a coalition with moderate parties. Because the vote threshold was so low to earn a seat in the Reichstag, many small parties had representation in the chamber. Perhaps this was a purer form of democracy, but this particular distillation led to difficulties in actual governance. Weakness and political splintering became the norm. There were 14 coalition governments in 12 years, until 1932, and after that, Subsequent ballots failed to bring about governance until Adolf Hitler was made chancellor. One of the largest challenges for any Weimar government was the payment of exorbitant war reparations imposed by the Allies, which amounted to $33 billion, approaching a half trillion in today's currency. Rather than raise additional revenues from the post-war population, the government took out high interest loans from the United States. The mark had already lost a third of its value by 1919, and the introduction of reparation payments on devalued currency began a spiral of inflation. While initial inflation might have been beneficial for debtors or employers offering higher wages, hyperinflation kicked in over four years. At its worst in November 1923, one American dollar was worth 4.2 trillion marks. Richard J. Evans wrote in his book The Coming of the Third Reich, a woman sitting down in a cafe might order a cup of coffee for 5,000 marks and be asked to give the waiter 8,000 for it when she got up to pay. In December 1923, a new currency tied to gold was issued, but the damage to the German mindset was done. Political splintering, national shame, and economic suffering were boons to a growing organization in Bavaria, the National Socialist German Workers' Party. William Shirer described their first party platform as a hodgepodge, a catch-all for workers, the lower middle class, and the poor. It called for a strong national government, unification of all German people, the end of the Versailles Treaty, and radical nationalism. Their charismatic leader Adolf Hitler first blipped onto the national stage in 1923 after a failed attempt to take over the Bavarian government in southern Germany. He and his Nazi collaborators declared a national revolution in the Bürgerbraukeller, held leading officials in the Bavarian government hostage, and clashed with Munich police near the center of town. While the coup, known today as the Beer Hall Putsch, failed resoundingly, Hitler's subsequent trial and imprisonment hoisted him onto the national stage. He used his media-covered trial as a platform for Nazism, and his eight-month imprisonment as time to work on his book, Mein Kampf. The rambling pages required heavy editing to maintain coherence, but broad goals were clear. A restoration of German honor through the elimination of the Versailles Treaty, a race-based state with a counter-centrifugal Fuhrer at the top, a drive to secure more living space, new land and soil for the German people, and a hatred of Jews and Marxists, whom Hitler often conflated. It was of very limited literary merit, and it was bigoted, but it wasn't baseless. Baseless in the sense that it had no cultural underpinning. It did. Hitler took the idea from one of his very early teachers that all German peoples, such as Austrians, be united in a single Reich. The idea that the German army had been betrayed during World War I by Jewish parliamentary criminals was shared by many. He wasn't the first to espouse a scientific racism which placed Aryan and Nordic races above the rest. And he wasn't the only nationalist to be, as he wrote, captivated immediately by the Germanic heroes of operas by Richard Wagner. He encapsulated a feeling that German greatness had been lost. The West itself, Oswald Spengler wrote, had declined. Hitler promised not only to restore it, but to go much further. It was a magniloquent medley of pseudoscientific ideas and cultural phenomena, soon to be boosted by the political chaos of the age. But not 
quite yet. Mein Kampf's initial printing in 1925 sold roughly 10,000 copies and dipped to only 3,000 by 1928. Low sales weren't just a product of Hitler's slog writing style. Life in Germany's Republic wasn't all negative as he portrayed, particularly for women who obtained full voting rights through the Constitution and who, in principle, according to Article 109, have the same rights and obligations as men. Though they struggled for equal wages in the workforce, they lived less restrictive private lives, even held public office. Such circumstances didn't apply across the board, particularly for rural and poor women, but Helen Boak writes in Women in the Weimar Republic that the rights granted to women in the revolution and constitution blurred the pre-war gender order. The remainder of the 20s was a time of cultural explosion, particularly in Berlin. Eric Weitz writes that Weimar was Berlin. Berlin, Weimar. Meaning that the nation's largest city was the center of its short-lived dynamism. It offered the best of Germany's republic. Countless museums, theaters, opera houses, beautiful squares with cafes and aspiring artists. Architecture, American jazz, risque nude shows, and esoteric spirituality. The war haunts Berliners. There's an awareness that even the greatest wealth can be evaporated by inflation. Life is terrible, live the moment. For this reason, Berlin also exemplifies the worst of Weimar. Sprawling poverty, political violence, sexual exploitation, and disease. Because of Berlin's prominence, it became the center of a political war, a war for the soul of Germany. Goebbels, the Führer of the National Ich halte diesen Reis dafür vollkommen überfällig und bin der Überzeugung, dass er aufgelöst werden muss, weil er nicht mehr dem Willen des Volkes entspricht. In the mid-1920s, Berlin contained the largest communist movement outside Moscow. Red Berlin's Communist Party boasted a quarter million members and a cash flow for party activities straight from the Kremlin. Soviet leadership expected Berlin to be ground zero of Germany's own Bolshevik revolution. When Hitler sent Joseph Goebbels to Berlin in 1927 to win the Red City for the Nazi cause, he faced a highly organized communist establishment equipped with two dozen political newspapers and a legacy solidified by the martyrdom of Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht in the aftermath of World War I. Berlin was skeptical, nay, barely aware of the Nazis. They scraped 1.5% of the Berlin vote in the 1928 elections. Berlin was on the move. Who had time for the apocalyptic hysteria of these Bavarian extremists? The Weimar government of the late 1920s was on the move as well. Inflation was back under control, and new arrangements for extending reparation payments were agreed. Sure, a lot of governing happened through emergency decree when the Reichstag was deadlocked, but there were glimmers of functionality. The Reichstag voted overwhelmingly in favor of unemployment insurance for workers, and another law granted mothers 12 weeks of maternity leave. As long as Western Europe and America continued to prosper, the Weimar Republic might have repaired its social inequality and healed its war wounds over time. But it wasn't to be. In America, the Wall Street crash in October 1929, you can pick your cliche, sent shockwaves, set off a domino effect. When the global depression arrived in Germany in 1929, it produced catastrophic collapse. As writer Heinrich Hauser put it, an almost unbroken chain of homeless men extends the whole length of the great Hamburg-Berlin highway. There are so many of them that they could shout a message from Hamburg to Berlin by word of mouth. Unemployment numbers shot over 3 million by the end of the year, a statistic that would jump over 6 million, around 30%, by late 1932. In sync with the global depression, foreign capital ceased to arrive in Germany. The national government was unable and unwilling to take out more loans or pay reparations in full. Wages fell, businesses closed, banks failed. And with the evaporation of the middle class, so too dried the political middle. Two parties benefited most from the economic fallout. First were the communists, whose official numbers tripled between 1929 and 1932. As the depression took hold, they mobilized to the unemployed, recruiting the downtrodden while marking territory and neighborhoods they defended with force. 
To meet their challenge came the Nazis. Goebbels turned up the heat in Berlin. He engaged the paramilitary wing of the party in street brawls meant to show heroism against what he called the communist hordes. These weren't mere scuffles. The SA brought brass knuckles, clubs, and metal bludgeons to the poor and middle class neighborhoods of the capital. They set things on fire. People were being killed in street violence every day and Goebbels portrayed any SA casualties as martyrs for the cause of National Socialism. Ultimately, though Nazis and Communists were diametrically opposed to the point of murdering each other on the streets, they did share one common goal, the death of the Republic. Not only was violence becoming normative, but many preferred the Weimar Constitution burn, that a new Germany be born of the ashes. In the economic turmoil, the Weimar government was barely functional, and so the SA and its various cover organizations acted with impunity. The Nazis were setting themselves up as the only saviors from the chaos to which they themselves were contributing. Nazism, which appealed to only a minority of voters in early 1929, was now more salient. The National Socialists pulled nearly 6% in Berlin council elections in November of 29, then more than doubling, 14.7% of Berlin's vote in 1930. Hitler could now pull enormous crowds and so-called Red Berlin, a place he wouldn't enter just a few years prior. Before the July 1932 federal elections, the clash between the SA and the communists reached its zenith. In Faust Metropolis, Alexandra Ritchie writes that the SA came equipped with rubber hoses, brass knuckles, and iron rods, with 400 street fights the month of the election and nine deaths on election day alone. With bodies cleared from the streets, the Nazis emerged as the largest party, netting 37% of the country's vote. Their closest competitors, the Social Democrats led by Otto Wells, brought in 25%, followed by the Communists at 14%. Not only did the Nazis win a plurality, but for the first time a majority of the German electorate cast ballots for parties, the Nazis and Communists, that wanted to do away with the Weimar Republic completely. They participated in the system so they could get rid of the system. Though denied the chancellorship directly after July's election, Hitler wouldn't need to wait long for another chance. Yet another election was called by embattled Chancellor Franz von Papen for November 1932, just four months later. And once again the Nazis emerged as the largest party. This time, after dramatic negotiation, Hitler was able to form a government and emerge as chancellor. Not eight weeks later, February 1933, Goebbels attends that dinner with his Fuhrer the Reichstag burned. Optimists at the time might have believed that the political repression as a result of the fire was only temporary. Sure, rights of speech, privacy, press, property, all under assault, but previous Weimar governments had censored this and that and banned parties temporarily. The moderates in Hitler's cabinet would hold him back. One such person who might have believed this was Communist Party Chairman Ernst Togler, who showed up a day after the fire to a police station to plead his non-involvement. Naturally, the fact that he was genuinely not involved was of no consequence. The SA threw him into one of Berlin's many prisons, now filling with political opposition. So flooded were the facilities that so-called wild concentration camps were conceived to house the victims of Nazi sadism. These camps were the first of many yet to come. With key provisions of the Weimar Constitution suspended, Hitler went about formally dismantling the rest. The Nazi party proposed to the Reichstag the Ermächtigungsgesetz, the Enabling Act. If passed, the Enabling Act would give Adolf Hitler the power to pass laws without the Reichstag. It would be the final nail in the coffin of the German Republic. All he needed to legalize his dictatorship was a yes vote of the Reichstag to do so. The Reichstag had to pass the Enabling Act. Hitler needed the German parliament to effectively vote itself out of existence by a two-thirds majority. The vote was scheduled for March 23rd, 1933 in the Kroll Opera House, the temporary meeting place of the Reichstag after the fire. Which brings you and me full circle. Section 2, Article 37 of the Weimar Constitution stipulated that without the approval of the German parliament, no member of that parliament could be detained or arrested for political reasons to prevent them from voting. It was a check against tyranny. But on the day of the vote of the Enabling Act, over 100 members of the Reichstag were gone. As was the case with Ernst Torgler, the head of the communist faction in the Reichstag, other elected communists were in prison, or perhaps just too frightened to show up. Over 100 members of the Reichstag were missing for the most important vote of their career. 
The Kroll Opera House was loud that day. The Nazi members inside the chamber were yelling for the passage of the Enabling Act, but even outside, members of the SA were patrolling with German shepherds. Hitler was present and gave a speech in support of his own legalized tyranny, but not before a speech by the leader of the opposition, Otto Wells. A quarter of his elected Social Democrats were in prison or stayed home. The threat of his own arrest clearly amplified by news of the torture the SA was inflicting on political opponents. But Otto Wells stood, spoke against the law. He promised that unbroken optimism would guarantee a brighter future. He gave what was to be the final opposition speech of the Weimar Republic, with Adolf Hitler looking on. And so I'm going to end this exploration with a little audio from that speech. In this section, he's speaking about violence to enforce peace and equal protection under the law. Aus einem Gewaltfrieden kommt kein Segen im Innern erst recht nicht. Eine wirkliche Volksgemeinschaft lässt sich auf ihn nicht gründen. Ihre erste Voraussetzung ist gleiches Recht. Mag sich die Regierung gegen rohe Ausschreitungen der Polemik schützen? Mag sie Aufforderung zu Gewalttaten und Gewalttaten selbst mit Strenge verhindern? Das mag geschehen, wenn es nach allen Seiten gleichmäßig und unparteiisch geschieht und wenn man es unterlässt, besiegte Gegner zu behandeln, als seien sie vogelfrei. Freiheit und Leben kann man uns nehmen, die Ehre nicht. Hey, Safer here, the cynical historian. The democracies of both the Weimar Republic and the United States have been subverted in significant ways that we ought to consider. Though we don't want to draw direct parallels, we hope these two episodes lend a particular interpretation on the ways that democracies can collapse. Click the card to come check out the video on my channel.